Hello. 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 And Hello. welcome everybody to this webinar, especially to all the parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles and all of those who play an active role in caring for children. Today, Troy and myself would like to talk to you about childhood first aid, children's safety at home, at play and in the car. And also what to expect about when you come to the emergency room here in Jaha, in John Hopkins Aramco Healthcare. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Una Maria and I've been a nurse for over 20 years. Um, I've been in Saudi for the past 13 years. Um, firstly with SAMSO and now with Jaha, John Hopkins Aramco Healthcare. So today we are going to talk about, well, I will talk to you about children's first aid and safety. And these are in particular areas that we see a lot of problems in the emergency room with parents bringing in their children, guardians bringing their children into us. So in relation to first aid, we're going to talk about burns, broken bones and sprains, stings, bites, allergies, and dental first aid. And in relation to safety, we'll talk about safety at home, play, and in the car. So burns firstly, what to do, and more importantly, what not to do. So burns are an injury. It's an injury to your skin. And the human skin is actually the largest organ in your body. Burns can be caused by heat, cold, chemicals, electricity, friction, and ultraviolet light. So sunburn. Burns can be very painful and very scary for a child and also for yourself witnessing your child getting burnt. So there are some basic treatments that you do with burns. So first of all, you do remove your child from the heat source. You do soak the burn in cold running water, not ice cold. Do remove any clothing or jewelry away from the affected area and do give pain relief. Do cover the area with a thin layer of plastic wrap or a clean cloth. Plastic wrap like this. We all have it in our houses. And basically, you want to wrap the area around a couple of times just to reduce the air getting in at the burn. You do not want to put ice on the area. You do not want to remove any clothing that is actually burnt or stuck to the skin. Do not put any butter, grease, toothpaste, creams, lotions, honey, talcum powder, coffee on the burns, because we do actually see quite a lot of that. Now, when to seek medical attention. There are different degrees of burns. There's first degree, second degree, third degree. You would recognize that terminology, but that terminology has now changed. And what we now would call first degree, we would um, call super superficial it's a redness to the top layer of your skin called the epidermis and when you look at it there wouldn't be any blistering second degree is now subdivided into superficial partial thickness and deep partial thickness and superficial partial thickness actually extends down to the superficial papillary dermis and when you observe the skin when you look at it it's going to be very red and there's going to be blistering on the skin. But when you put pressure on it, there will be blanching under pressure. Deep partial thickness extends down to the deep particular dermis. And when you look at it, it can be yellow or white, and there would also be blistering. Third degree is now called full thickness burns. And this is the entire dermis, and it would look brown or it could look white, there would be no blanching to the skin. Fourth degree extends down the entire dermis and the, also in the underlying fat muscle and down to the bone, usually from chemicals. So you can imagine if you put honey or toothpaste on this burn, when you come into the emergency room, we were going to have to clean this off. And even with pain relief, that can be incredibly painful. So burns from acids, chemicals, electrical sources, you need to come into the emergency room. There are about 25,000 chemicals, bases and acids that can cause a chemical burn. 
Most chemical burns, unfortunately, if they are ingested, cause death. The most common are sulfuric acid, which is found in toilet cleaners, which we all have in our houses. And the other is sodium hypochlorite, which is found in bleach. Again, we all have it in our houses. Electrical burns in particular are very difficult for non-medical personnel to examine and assess. So you come into the emergency room and let us do that for you. Let us look after your child. To determine if you have a large burn, what you're going to do is you'd look at your child's hand. Examine the burn. If the burn is bigger than your child's hand, you need to come to the emergency room. If their burn is to the hands, to the face, to the legs, to the arms, or to the general gen genitalia, that can cause blistering, you also need to come into the emergency room. Now, remember, almost half of all burns are preventable in adults. But in children, that rises to almost all are preventable in relation to children. Prevention is the key. Next, we're going to go quickly on to stings, bites and allergies. Now, bees, wasps and ants. And there are over two different, 200 different types of ants here in Saudi Arabia, according to antwiki.com. With most of these, you don't need to come to the emergency room. What you'll do is you can put, get a cold compress, you can put it onto the skin, and then you need to try and remove the stinger if there is a stinger. You'll see in the slide there that there's two options. You can remove the stinger by pulling it out, but a better option is to get your credit card. And what you're going to do is you're going to sweep, use a sweeping movement to force up the stinger. Okay? Now, in most cases, if the stinger is, especially in allergic reactions, if the stinger is remains inside, you'll come into the emergency room and we will try and remove it. Bites. Animal and human bites, especially human bites, they can carry a lot more infection, unfortunately, than animals. You need to come to the emergency room. Antibiotics are more than likely going to be required, especially if the wound is deep. And you also need to come because, unfortunately, rabies is still active here in Saudi Arabia. Rabies causes about 24, 24 to 64,000 deaths worldwide every year. And since 2018, unfortunately, the numbers here in Saudi have gradually been increasing. A paper done by Kasim et al. in 2019, in, published in the Journal of Infectious Public Health, did a survey here in Saudi. Between 2010 and 2017, there was 199 animals checked for rabies. And unfortunately, they had a positive rate of 79.4%, which was 158 animals. Now, of those, dogs and camels were the main reservoirs for rabies. So rabies is still a public health concern here in Saudi. So yes, if you do are not aware of the vaccination status of the animal that has bitten your child, you come in and let us assess it. Allergies. Now, allergies can be very frightening. Children and adults can get an allergic reaction from medication, from food, from bites. Um, so you need to know your the allergic your your child's allergic status, write them down. If your child is allergic to a certain medication, to a certain food, teach your child what they're allergic to when they're old enough. And you need to be very aware also. Allergies happen when your child breathes in, touches, eats something that they're allergic to. They produce histamines and this causes the allergies. So. The symptoms that you can get are abdominal pain, you can get shortness of breath, you can get swelling to the face and in particular to the tongue. You can have difficulty in swallowing, a tightness in your throat. You can get a rash all over your body. In some cases, you only get a rash. It's okay. Nothing much to worry about. It can be a bit annoying. But if you get problems with swelling to your face, to your tongue, 
you need to come into the emergency room or better yet, call for an ambulance. An ambulance has life-saving medication and equipment on board. So en route, coming back to the emergency room, they can already treat your child. If you are prescribed an EpiPen, know how to use it and give it. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline in other countries, helps to relax the muscles blocking the airways and helps the breathing to return more to normal. But very importantly, try and keep yourself calm. Try and keep your child calm. Don't give them anything orally. If they start to vomit, turn them on their side. Let the vomit roll out. Keep their clothing loose so that will aid their breathing. Next, we're going to go quickly on to broken bones and sprains. Now, a fracture is a break. OK, it's a broken bone. It's a medical term for a broken bo bone. There are different types of fractures, as you can see in this slide. Most of the mo most children unfortunately, will get like a hairline or a hairline or a green stick fracture. It's a minor break. It can heal quite rapidly. We can put a plaster or fiberglass cast on it, sometimes just immobilization. In children, most Fractures happen from falls or car accidents, sport injuries, football, soccer is the main culprit here. And the symptoms that you will see when it does happen is you can see out of shape limbs. They can be bruised. They can have intense pain, numbness and tingling. You can have limited movement. The child will not move their limb. They won't move their arm. They won't move their leg. Children are really good at protecting themselves from pain. And what they'll do is they'll protect, put their, their limb in a neutral position. When you come to the emergency room, what you will do is we'll x-ray. Sometimes, depending on the fracture, maybe a CT might be necessary. And if a CT isn't, isn't suitable for your child, there could always be an MRI. So what do you do when you see it? First of all, you don't panic. Try and stay calm. Try and keep your, your child calm. And you can use things that you have in your house. You can use a splint. I made this splint yesterday. It's very rudimental, I know. But you can push your hands in there. It's, you're not trying to fix the fracture. You're just trying to immobilize it so that the fracture doesn't get worse. You can also make an improvised sling out of a scarf or a sweatshirt. There you go. That is a sling. You're holding, you're protecting your whole arm, your elbow, your, your humerus, which is your uh, bone from your shoulder down to your elbow. And also you need to give pain relief to your child. Giving a small amount of pain relief is not going to do any harm to your child while you're coming to the emergency room, okay? Now, when it comes to sprays, we use a method which has been around for quite a long time, as long as I've been a nurse, and it's called the RICE method. And it's called rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Now, a sprain sometimes can often be suspected as a break. And when we finish the x-ray, there's no fracture. A sprain affects the ligaments. A strain affects the tendons and the muscles. Now, both tendons and ligaments are connective tissues. A sprain occurs when a, a ligament is moved in an unnatural way and the ligaments get pulled and stretched. So we use rice. We rest the foot or the arm. You use ice. And you need to use ice more than once a day. You need to use it at least three to four times during the day, 20 minutes at a time to help reduce down the swelling and also the pain. Compression will also help and elevation to help bring down the, the, the swelling as well. Treatment. Now, sometimes if a sprain is very bad, if you're not able to mobilize on it, we can also put a cast on it as well. We can splint it. 
we give pain relief. You must take your pain relief as it's prescribed. Sometimes, unfortunately, with breaks, yes, children might need to have surgery. Plates, pins, screws need to be put in to put the bone back in place and crutches as well. OK, prognosis and healing in fractures. Good news is children heal really quickly, especially younger children. It can heal in a matter of three to four weeks. Older children, adolescents up to six weeks. But prevention, same with everything else, is key. Fractures are common in childhood. Unfortunately, we cannot wrap our children in bubble wrap, even though sometimes we would like to. So we can ensure that they get proper nutrition, they get good physical exercise, and they also, they also use protect, protective gear. So sunshine, proper nutrition, and protective gear is one of the most important things. Osteoporosis, the disease that causes bones to become less dense and more prone to fractures in older age, has been called the childhood disease with an old age consequences. Because the bo bone mass that you attend, at develop in childhood and adolescence is an important determinant for lifelong skeletal health. So basically, pardon the pun, it is the, the childhood habits that you form can literally make or break your children's bones. Next, we're going to move on to dental first aid. Now, if a child's tooth comes out, if it's their, if it's their non-permanent teeth, their milk teeth, you don't need to worry. It comes out, it comes out. Control the bleeding, don't panic. If it is the permanent teeth, though, you should hold the tooth by the crown, place it in a cup of milk. If you don't have milk, you can place it into a plastic bag wrapped in gauze and then put it into ice, not directly onto ice. You could also try, if your child is old enough, if your child is not old enough, then don't do this, but you can try and put it back into the socket. If it doesn't stay, you can put it in between the cheek and the gums. And obviously, very importantly, try not to swallow the tooth. Next, we're going to move on to safety at home. Now, child proofing your home is one of the most important things to keep your child safe. Most parents know to get child proof stairs, uh, child proof gates for the stairs. They know to lock away your knives, your sharp knives, to lock away your sharp scissors, secure the TVs onto the wall so that a child can't pull them down onto themselves. But unfortunately, there's one area that we still face considerable concern in the emergency room, and that's ingestion of dangerous substances. So items such as bleach, all-purpose cleaners, drain openers, toilet cleaners, dishwasher, laundry turfs, nail polish, mouthwash, perfume, medication, prescription, and non-prescription should be locked away at all times. If there's somebody else in your house taking the medication, talk to them, explain to them the, the importance of locking away their medication. Button batteries and magnets. Now, button batteries, despite warnings on the packages since 2016, is still one of the leading causes of deaths in pediatric poisonings. The second being button batteries is when you swallow it, it interacts with saliva. And this saliva makes generates hydroxic ions at the negative poles. And this creates a corrosive injury to the esophagus, to your stomach, to the nose, wherever the child has put it up. And a, a battery, 20 millimeters, so two centimeters, can cause severe damage within two hours. Strong magnets have become commonplace at home. Adults use them as stress relievers. Children have them in their building blocks. But if they're swallowed, at this, the progression of the magnet through the GI tract should be x-rayed at between every 6 to 12 hours. Also, if there's a possibility that that magnet or more than two magnets have actually been swallowed, 
This raises the possibility of a bowel perforation. These strong magnets, if you have clothing that has belts or has a metal buttons, they should be removed, okay? Liquid nicotine. Vaping has become hugely popular, hugely popular. But liquid nicotine can kill a child if ingested. So please, I can't stress this more than that. You need to lock away all of these types of products, please. And when I say lock away, I don't mean put them under the sink. They need to be in an area that a child cannot to get to them. Same as phone chargers that are plugged in. We all have to charge our phones, unfortunately. But children see the wires and they play with them and they put them into the electrical sockets. Again, please lock them all away. Children at play. All children love to play and we want to encourage our children to play. But there, we need to be safe. On a bicycle or a scooter, make sure they wear a helmet. Make sure that they have high visibility jackets if they're riding in the evenings and at night time. Teach them the rules of the road and get them to obey the rules of the road. Teach them how to use hand signals when they're turning right and left. Get them to respect the traffic lights. And when they cycle, make sure that they cycle on the right side of the road. Now, next we're going to talk briefly about all-terrain vehicles, quad bikes. You see in the picture here, there's a guy, he's on his, he's on his quad bike with his child in front of him. Neither are wearing helmets, neither are wearing any elbow pads, chin guards, knee pads. The child is wearing short clothes. One in every children on a quad bike will experience an accident of some sort. Now, Jawadi in 2011 did actually do a article in King Fahad National Guard Hospital in Riyadh. And he looked at all of the admissions over 10 years that were due to quad bikes. And in particular, the fish. And the reason being is amputations to fish, lower legs and knees, toes, are the most common serious injury that can happen from a quad bike. What happens is the child falls off. Their feet get caught in the chain of the quad bike and they can get crushed and amputated. So in his article, over 10 years, 49 children had either both or one foot, toe, or had a baloney amputation from being on the quad bike. And when he looked at the ages of these children, the mean age was found to be three years and nine months. So again, prevention is key. You need to wear long sleeves, wear long trousers, wear a helmet. You also need to make sure, you also need to make sure that your child is wearing knee pads, elbow pads, we have to do this for our children because unfortunately the regulations here in Saudi does not require when they're renting it from the person to provide these equipment for your child. Now, lastly, we're going to talk about safety in the car. Again, another huge area to, of prevention. Use the appropriate seat for your child, please. Never leave your child alone in the car, especially when the car is running. Never leave your child alone in a car with the car turned off. The temperatures can reach deadly within minutes, especially here in Saudi in the heat. Never let your children put their hands, their heads outside of the windows. Children should always be in the back seat. You, most cars now do have um that's uh locks on both sides for the kids use them use the child lock and ensure that when you do put a seat belt on your child that there is no risk of strangulation okay this is why car seats are so important so even though you may think that you're doing the right thing by putting a, a, a seat belt on your child if your child is too small for that seat belt 
you could cause a strangulation risk if there is an accident. Thank you all very, very much for listening to me. I hope you've all learned something. And I'm going to hand over to Freud. There is a list here of my of my references that if any of you want to look them up. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Maria, for that very nice presentation. So my name is Fräulein Tabuzo, and I work in emergency department, just like Maria. I've been more than 20 years in emergency. Right now, I'm one of the charge nurses. I teach um, basic life support, advanced life support, pediatric life support, and as well as trauma courses uh, to nurses, and doctors as well. So right now I'll be talking about understanding common illnesses and injuries in children. And my first topic is about head injuries and that includes not just the head, I'll be including a portion of the neck, back and or spine injuries as well. So head injury in children, uh, this, this is one of the most common causes of disability in children. Although 90% of child uh, childhood head injuries are minor, such as bumps, um, small, uh, bumps, bruise, or cut or on the head, superficial laceration, it can also lead to moderate to severe uh, head injury, which can cause internal bleeding and even damage to the brain. Uh, causes of head injury, it can be from motor vehicular accident, it can be from fall, assaults, bicycle accidents, sports trauma, and child abuse. So it is important also that you will know how to recognize head injury. And this is um, from checking the physical signs, uh, such as bruises, bumps, lacerations or cuts, visible deformities or dents at the site of impact a black and blue discoloration around the eyes. We call it as raccoon as eyes or raccoon syndrome or discoloration behind the ear. So you have to check the, the, the back of the ear as well. And we call that as bottle sign in medical term. Uh, you gotta check for the any discharges coming up from the ear, blood or clear water uh, discharges. Clear fluid oozing from the nose is also a danger sign of head injury. For infant, a bulging soft spot between the skull bones or fontanel, that's also a sign of head injury. So warning signs after head injury, uh, you have to observe your kid. In the first 24 hours, if you see these warning signs, you have to go to um, emergency department or call 911 immediately. So I'll be, I'll be telling you some of the warning signs after head injury. Number one, if there is a loss or changes in level of consciousness, if there is an increasing drowsiness, confusion, or difficult to arouse, this is a danger sign. If there is seizure, if there is bleeding and water or clear drainage coming out from ears or nose, that's a warning sign. Pupils that is low to react or there is an abnormal um, differences of the pupil. One is large and one is, one is larger. That is a warning sign also. Visual problems like double, double vision or even blurring of vision is also a warning sign. Loss of sensation to one of the extremities, unsteady gait, a weakness in one side of the body, slurring of speech, projectile vomiting, or severe and constant headache. This requires immediate attention. So we'll talk about prevention for kids for head injury. Never leave your baby alone in a bed, chair, or raised surface. Instead, place the baby in a crib or playpen. Do not use baby walkers if unattended. I myself had an experience about this. I was a young mother and I placed my kid 
um, on my daughter, she was about eight or nine months. I placed her on a walker. I turned my back. As soon as I turned my back, boom, she dropped on the stairs. We live in the second floor, by the way. She, uh, she was admitted in the hospital for one day with a laceration from the, uh, from the forehead extending to the eyebrow. It was devastating. So that, that's why I am talking about this. Please, please do not use baby walkers if unattended. Okay, install safety gates, just like Maria said, uh, pro uh, safety proof your house, use window guards, use, um, you know, those uh, corner guards, uh, put it on the, at the edges of your uh, table. Uh, you can buy this uh, in Amazon or even in Centerpoint, it's very cheap. Just put some corner guards, uh, use car safety seats as well. Wear protective head headgear and helmets during sports uh, activities. Trampoline supervision. Okay, this is very important. I know trampoline is fun, but it may actually cause dangerous injuries, including um, neck, head, definitely, neck or spine injuries. Now, trampoline is not actually advisable for six-year-old and below. Why? Because... Uh, their bones are still not strong enough to handle the impact of repetitive jumping. So it's uh, not advisable, please. And remove trampoline ladder after use. This way, it will um, prevent uh, unsupervised access of the kid to the trampoline, you know, when you're not around. So always remove the ladder. When shopping, avoid placing the child in the car basket. Why? Injuries from car tipping over is increased nowadays, leading to head and neck injuries. Treatment is individualized depending on the severity of the injury and extent of the condition. As uh, Maria said, you get a, uh, she talked about rice and head injury. I'll be talking about ice rest, uh, observation, acetaminophen, and topical antibiotic ointments and adhesive bandages for minor cases. For moderate to severe, immediate medical attention is needed. Sometimes doctor will put stitches or sutures, hospitalization for observation, and they may need to do some tests such as x-rays, CT scan, MRI, EEG or electroencephalogram, some blood tests, and worse comes to where sometimes patient goes straight to surgery or OR. Again, if the child has mild head injury with no worrisome signs and symptoms, the child can be monitored and treated at home. Treat mild headaches and pain with acetaminophen or Tylenol, wash off dirt, clean and dress superficial bruises or cuts. Avoid giving aspirin, brufen or Advil and Motrin, um, naproxen or indomethacin due to increased risk of bleeding. Again, if your child does not respond to your voice or touch develop and develop serious symptoms, and those warning signs that I talked to you about earlier, call 911 or your local emergency number or the Red Crescent, I, the number is 997, or proceed to emergency department. Now, next topic, I will talk about seizures in, and epilepsy in children. You know, epilepsy is a brain condition that, um, uh, that causes a child to have seizure. It is the most common disorder of the nervous system that affects the children and as well as adults of all races and ethnic backgrounds. High fever, critically high or low blood sugar, brain concussion or injury can lead to seizure. Now a child with two or more seizures with no unknown costs in the, in the 24 hour period, this is diagnosed as epilepsy. So what are the causes of seizure in children? You know, the first thing is very medical, an imbalance of nerve signaling chemicals or the neurotransmitters in the brain. There is a brain tumor. It could be infection such as meningitis, a stroke or lack of oxygen to the brain. 
brain damage from illness or injury or even febrile seizures due to high grade fever. Now, um, symptoms of seizure in children. Seizure is not only seen as a forceful, forceful, uncontrolled jerking movements of the body, arms, and legs. It can be a staring spell also. Uh, it can also be, um, you know, not responding to noise or words for brief periods. Nodding head rhythmically when associated with loss of awareness or consciousness. Some kids after a seizure, they wet their pads. They lost, there is a loss of bowel or bladder control. Uh, there is, uh, it could also be a symptom of peri periods of rapid eye blinking and staring or stiffening of the body. Sometimes it goes uh, to loss of consciousness as well. Now how, now, how are seizures diagnosed in children? The healthcare provider will ask about your child's symptoms and health history. You'll be asked about other factors that may have caused the child's seizure. The doctor may ask about recent uh, fever or infection, head injury, is there any congenital health condition, is the baby preterm birth, or is there any recent medications that you started on your kid? The doctor may also do some neurological exams, such as blood tests, to check for problems in blood sugar and other factors. Imaging tests of the brain, such as MRI or CT scan, EEG or electroencephalogram, and this is to test the electrical activity in your child's brain. Lumbar puncture, or sometimes called spinal tap. This is to measure the pressure in the brain and spinal canal and test the cerebral uh, spinal fluid for infection or other problems. How are seizures treated in child? Medications, diet modification, and avoiding triggers. Now, how can I help my child live with epilepsy? If age appropriate, make sure your child understand the condition he or she has and the type of medicine that he is taking. Know, your, know the dose, the time, and side effects of all medications that he's taking. Talk, talk to your child's healthcare provider before giving your child other medications as medicines for seizures can interact with many other medications. Help your child avoid anything that may trigger a seizure. Make your child gets enough sleep, as lack of sleep can also trigger a seizure. Make sure your child visit his or health care provider regularly and have your child tested as often as needed. Now, what are you going to do when you see your child having an epileptic or sometimes convulsive um, measure, a seizure? Number one, very common, do not panic. Turn on their side and start timing the seizure. Stay with the child and do not restrain. Place cushion or something soft under the head. Do not force or put anything in the mouth. Call 911 or 997 if seizure lasts more than five minutes. And that is the main reason why you need to time the seizure in, or immediately proceed to emergency department. Now, next topic is syncope in children or sometimes called fainting or passing out. What is syncope in children? Syncope is a brief loss of consciousness and muscle tone that can occur when there is not enough blood that gets into the brain. Now, what are the causes in syncope, uh, in uh, syncope in the child? Uh, vasovagal syndrome. This, uh, this is a heart condition that can cause a sudden uh, rapid drop in heart rate and blood pressure. It could also cause by arrhythmia or problem with the rate and rhythm of the heart, the structural heart disease, or orthostatic hypotension, uh, or sometimes called postural hypotension. And this is, uh, this is a form of low blood pressure 
that happens when you stand up immediately from lying down okay there is a decrease of systolic blood pressure you know this is so medical uh, there is a decrease of systolic blood pressure of um about 20 millimeter uh, mercury or a decrease sudden decrease of uh, diastolic blood pressure is very medical but um that's uh, one of the causes other causes or illnesses that can cause syncope include head injury seizure stroke inner ear problems dehydration low blood sugar breath holding episodes anemia brain mass even pregnancy aneurysm or abnormality of the blood vessels of the brain and even having you know a bowel movement and you do that about salva maneuver sometimes you can have fainting or syncope in that what are the symptoms of syncope in child? Some children will have symptoms before they faint. So there, there is a warning sign, like your child will complain of dizziness, lightheadedness, or nausea, or even change in his or her vision. Patient may have cold or sweaty or clammy skin. So these are warning signs. Now, how is syncope treated in a child? After an episode of syncope, your child should lie down for 10 to 15 minutes. Your child can also sit with his or her head between the knees. Give your child a drink of water. Now, if a heart problem is caused by syncope, the pediatric cardiologist will figure out what treatment is needed. Occasionally, the problem can also be due to brain problem and may require consultation with a pediatric neurologist. Now, what can you do to prevent your child from passing out? To prevent passing out that caused by dehydration, of course, stay hydrated, especially in hot summer months, especially this month. It is very e easy to have to get your child dehydrated. So always, always bring water and offer water to your child. If passing out occurs when standing too long, advise your child not to lock his or her knees when standing. Advise your child to promote blood flow by relaxing and tightening the leg muscle. Now, if your child has passed out after standing, make sure your child sits up slowly. Let his or her legs hang up the bed or elevate the feet above the level of the heart or about 12 inches. Tell him or her to wiggle the toes and take a deep breath before standing up. Now, this is a kid, for example, this is a child. Now, I'll demonstrate to you some of the fainting first aid, okay? So, if your child fainted, lay the child on his back. Lay the child on his back. Hang on, I think I'm going to adjust the camera. Lay the child on his back and elevate the leg, okay? That's it. Can you see it? So that's, you elevate the leg, put something under the leg, pillow or anything. All right, elevate the leg. And then do not, do not put water, please. Do not slap the kid or put water immediately or directly to the face, okay? Do not leave your child. Get someone, get someone to call 911 or anything. Just observe, okay? Observe if the kid or is breathing. If the kid or your child stop breathing, you have to start CPR. Okay, you have to start CPR. Okay. Now, uh, now I'll talk about poisoning, swallowed poison. If you find your child with an open or empty container of a toxic substance, your child may have been poisoned. Stay calm and act quickly. Get the poison away from the child. If the substance is still in the child's mouth, make your child spit it out if he can, or you can remove it if you can see it. Keep whatever you take out of uh, your child's mouth to help identify the substance. Bring it with you to the emergency department. Don't make the child vomit. Call the Poison Control Center, call emergency department, 
or call any doctor, okay? It's particular, particularly toxicologists. Now, if your child has any of the following symptoms, sick immediate emergency care, sore throat. If you notice a sore throat, hoarseness of voice, trouble breathing, drowsiness, irritability or jumpiness, nausea, vomiting or stomach pain without fever, lip or mouth burns or blisters, unusual drooling, strange odors on his or her mouth or breath, unusual stains on his or her clothing, seizure or unconsciousness, take the poison container with you, with your child to help the doctor find out what was ingested. Immediately proceed to emergency department. Now, let's talk about first aid measures uh, if the poison gets into your skin. If your child spills a chemical on his or her body, remove any contaminated clothes. Rinse the skin well with lukewarm water, not hot, okay? If the skin looks burnt or irritated, continue rinsing it for uh, 15 minutes, at least 15 minutes. And do this even if your child complains. I know kids, they, they will complain, they will cry, they will fight off, but please continue to do this for at least 15 minutes. Call again, call the poison center uh, for further instructions and don't put ointments, butter, or grease on the area. Just like what Maria said, don't put anything, you know, extraordinary to the poisoned skin. Okay. Now, poison in the eye or eyes, you have to flush your child's eye by holding the eyelid open. Okay, eyelid open. Pour a small, steady, lukewarm water, again, not hot, into the inner corner near the nose, okay? Inner corner near the nose. Let the water run across the eyes to the outside corner to flush the area well. You may need uh, help from another adult to hold your child while you rinse the water, while you rinse the eye with uh, lukewarm water. Alternately, wrap your child tightly in a towel and hold your child under one arm. Can I have the baby, please? <laughs> okay. So, so, for example, this is the towel. You have to wrap it. Wrap your baby or your child and then put it under your arm. And then, for example, this is the water. Pour a steady, small a stream water from the inner corner of the of the eye and then let it pour down same thing on the other side inner corner to outside okay to the outer side now continue flushing the eye for 15 minutes again uh, call poison center to find out what to do next don't use an eye cup or eye drops or ointments unless Poison Center tells you to do so. Now, poisonous fumes or gases, poisonous fumes uh, can come from a car running in a closed garage, leaky gas, gas vents, wood, coal, or kerosene stoves that are not working properly, bleach and ammonia mix while cleaning. This mi mixture makes chloramine gas, uh, some fires, uh, strong fumes from other cleaner solvents as well. So if your child breathes in fumes or gases, get them outdoors to fresh air right away. If your child is breathing without a problem, call the poison center to find out what to do. If your child is having difficulty breathing, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency department. Again, if your child has stopped breathing, start CPR. Don't stop until your child breathes, breathes again on its own or, her, or, or someone else can take over. If you have someone, call 911 right away. If you are alone, do CPR for two minutes and then call 911, okay? Provide at least a breathing and compression for two minutes, then call 911. Now, um, child-resistant leads are required on certain common household products, baby oils, sunscreens, uh, dry, nail, animal and dryers, hair oils. This should have uh, 
leads, child resistant leads, uh, makeup removers, even some automotive uh, chemicals such as gasoline, fuel injection cleaners, uh, cleaning solvents such as wood, oil cleaners, metal cleaners, spot removers, and adhesive removers. Oils in the house, like general oil, household uh, gun cleaning solvents, all this must be kept in a safe place and has to have a safety leads on. All right, that's about it. That's from my topic. And I'm going to uh, shift to another topic, which is visiting the emergency department and what, what to expect. Now, our uh, main emergency department is located in the Haran, but we also have smaller uh, satellite or smaller ED districts in Rastanura, Abkeik, Udaliya, and Alhasa. And we operate 24 hours, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all holiday, rain or shine, we're open always, okay? They're all emergency department physicians and nurses and paramedics receive special training to manage variety of emergency conditions from minor to complex cases. Now, when you enter in the emergency department at the entrance, there is a visual triage who will screen for infectious condition and life-threatening conditions. Now, if you present to emergency department and you have cough, fever, or even shortness of breath, you will be there, you will be directed to a specific place, and we call it as a respiratory uh, triage or the respiratory waiting area. And this is maintained with a negative pressure room. Now, if you come to emergency department with a life-threatening condition, you will go directly inside and be managed immediately by physicians and nurses. Now, before coming in for regular uh, patients, uh, there is a registration desk there. They will ask for your um, national ID number, right? As much as possible, we encourage you please to bring your national ID card, okay? So you there, so there will be an ease of registration. You will be taking care, uh, taken to a care area where you are evaluated by physician and nurse. Care will be started immediately upon arrival to care area. And we just implemented the care initiation area as, uh, as, as soon as you have registered, a nurse will collect you and place you to a, to a care initiation area and you will be assessed both by the nurses and a doctor. We try to care for you as soon as possible. Sometimes there are situations where a delay is in inevitable, such as uh, you require consultation by a specialty services who might be busy serving other patients. For example, uh, you need a gynae doctor and the gynae at that moment is having cesarean section procedure or uh, very busy. So there will a little bit of delay, but we will inform you that there is a delay on those uh, things. You require further treatment. So if, uh, if you require further treatment or workup that is time specific, for example, a procedure that requires your child to be on an empty stomach and the child just ate, of course, there will be a delay as well. There, if there is an influx of very sick patients that require immediate interventions, expect a little bit of delay. So we need your understanding also with regards to this. But again, our aim is to provide immediate attention to you. You can help us improve our services through asking questions. If you need further information, filling out the post-visit survey, we take those surveys very seriously. Whether you had a positive or negative experience, we would love to hear from you. Compliance with the treatment team's advice and instructions is very important, of course, and discussing your care with our patient relations unit is uh, available also upon requests. All right, so that's my topic for today. And reference is in this in the monitor right now. Uh, basically, the Johns Hopkins Medicine is um, is uh, 
involved, Boston Ch Children's Hospital and so on. All right, thank you so much for today. And may I call on Maria again to say goodbye to you and hopefully uh, we'll see you in emergency department and we'll say hi, bye. Take care. Take thank care, you. everyone.